We continue with our study in the book of Acts. If you have your Bible, please turn with me to Acts 27. We're going to pray and jump through the text today. Lord, we are grateful again. We are thankful for what you have done. We are thankful that you are our Lord and our Savior. And humbly we come before you this morning asking of you that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would open our minds and our eyes to see more clearly as we ought to. And I pray that as we read your word, we go through it, that you will be glorified. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. We have a text before us that is a continuation of what we've been going through. Uh, we concluded last week with uh, this guy, Herod Agrippa and Festus, uh, talking amongst themselves and saying, this, this guy, if he didn't appeal to Caesar, there's no case for this guy. This guy is an innocent man. Uh, but because he's appealed to Caesar, then uh, he's supposed to appear there. That was the right for every Roman citizen. If they uh, felt like the judgment wasn't right or they want to just appeal to Caesar, they were allowed to do so. So this is, whatever we, we have today is technically a journey um, of Paul and other people are trying to get to Italy. So let's get to it. And when it was decided that we should sail to Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners uh, to one named Julius, a centurion of the Augustan regiment. So most of the, the other times we actually didn't see the writer look appearing most of the time in, you know, in prison and all these things that were happening. But now he's back here uh, and he includes himself to this uh, journey. They say when we, when it was decided we, that is Luke and the Apostle Paul and other prisoners, and also a man uh, from Macedonia, Thessalon uh, from Thessalonica, was with them also. They joined this journey, uh, verses 3, and the next day we landed at Sidon. And Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him liberty to go to his friends and receive care. So what this uh, Romans would do if they have a prisoner they were not obligated, actually it was not uh, in them to help them with food and other humanitarian help that they would give them. And so this man was kind enough to um, give, give Paul the liberty to visit his friends to receive some care, uh, maybe some food and um, whatever was needed for Paul at that time. And when we had put to sea from there, we sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the sea, which is of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing to Italy, and he put us on board. So they, you know, it's like there was a layover and then they're catching the next flight, catching the next ship. When we had sailed slowly many days and arrived with difficulties of uh, Nidus, the wind 
not permitting us to proceed, we sailed under the shelter of Crete, of Salmon. Passing it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Heavens, near the city of last year. Now when much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and ship, but also our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmets and the honor of the sheep than by the things spoken by Paul. And because the harbor was not suitable to winter in, the majority advised to set sail from there also, if by any means they could reach Phoenix and harbor of Crete opening towards the southwest and the northwest and winter there. A lot of things are happening right here already that as they're sailing, um, Paul has been, you know, traveling for quite some time. Uh, his first and second and third missionary journey, he, he, he was traveling by, by sea most of the time, and he's experienced a lot of things that would uh, be helpful for people who need help. But you see sometimes when people don't know who you are and you're trying to help them, what they want to do is just to shut you up so that you you know, you don't give them counsel, you don't advise them accordingly because there's a way they're used to doing things. You know, the, the sailor and the jailer and all these prisoners, they probably look at Paul like, you, you're just another prisoner. What do you have to tell us? I mean, what experience do you have in terms of sailing the ships? What, what kind of advice would you give us that is safe? Already we are in trouble. We're in the middle of the sea. But Paul, maybe through the Holy Spirit, maybe through experience, he's warning them. And they're not listening. And sometimes, and most of the time, you know, we think that the majority are always right. Right? <laughs> like, you know, the, the majority said this, so we got to follow and when we, you ask the majority or the crowd about a specific issue, they're like, no, you know, I just joined. I kind of like on the edge. I don't know what is really happening, you know. But you're cheering them. But you're, 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 you're validating this issue. You're speaking towards this issue in the crowd. Most of the time, there's, there's mob there's no justice in the mob. You guys know that, right? They've done that to Paul many times. When they're dragging Paul, and Paul, you know, the governor is like, hey, so what is happening with this? And people are shouting this, and they're shouting this, and no one has clarity of what is happening. And here we have just one man giving counsel to the whole crew, but they don't want to listen. You know, a lie doesn't become the truth because it's spoken by many people against one. You guys know that, right? There's a guy called Robert T. Washington. He said these words, that a lie doesn't become truth, wrong doesn't become right, and evil doesn't become good just because it is accepted by a majority. So because the majority are doing this, because they are lying about things, because, you know, I'm, I'm just want to follow the majority. And sometimes people are just following it and we, you, you try to ask them and say, well, you know, it would be sh kind of shameful for me to stand for this a 
alone. You know, what, what will my friends say? What will my colleagues say? But through the scripture we see that Paul is always standing for righteousness regardless. Everybody's against him. He stands for what is, what is right. So friends, always stand for what is right even when you are alone. It is costly though. Paul warned them. When the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their desires, putting out the sea, they stayed close by Crete. But not long after a temperate headwind arose called Eurolydon. That was the temperate wind from the west. So when the ship was caught and could not head into the wind, we let her drive. It was uncontrollable. They couldn't control. So they just, we, we're just going to let the wind do what it would do. We, we don't know what to do. We are in the middle of it. They begin to be scared and running under the shelter of an island called Claudia. We secured this calf with difficulty. When they had taken it on board, they used cables to undergird the ship. And fearing lest they should run aground on the site recents, they stuck sail and so were driven. And because we were exceedingly tempest tossed, the next day, they lightened the ship. And on the third day, we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. And now when neither the sun or the stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we could, that would be saved, was finally given this is what we're going to talk about today, hope for the hopeless. In a world where, you know, what we are craving for is hope. And many times we want to find it in places um, that are not right, in places where uh, we'll be taken advantage of, in places where, you know, God has not led us to. But because we crave for hope, we're just going to try to find it. You see, your hope as a believer is in the Lord if you're born again. He causes all things in your life, including problems and trials, to work together for good as you continually respond in love, demonstrated through obedience to him. And out of the hope that God provides, your faith and love can be biblically expressed in any situation. And understanding and responding biblically to problems glorify God while he further comforts you to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Hope. Every one of us is craving for it. Everyone is looking for hope. Some in the right place, some in the wrong places. Paul, here with the rest of the prisoners and the centurion and the soldiers are here. And every ounce of hope they had is all gone. What you gonna do about it? You, you, it, it is amazing to me that it see, says here that neither the sun nor the stars appeared for many days. How was it? No sun, 
No stars, there's total darkness. What are you going to do? You, you, you don't even know how to count days right now. <laughs> how do you count? You don't know whether it's night, it's day. It is just dark. There's no light. And you're stuck. This is the point where many people, many believers, would compromise because they do not know what is ahead of them. They would take whatever comes. All hope that we would be saved was finally given up. You've given up. You don't know what is going to happen. You don't know how it's going to happen. You don't know where this help is going to come. But nonetheless, if you are a believer, you know Christ's love towards us, would anchor us even in the middle of all these things. This man called J.C. Rice writes and says that Christ loves towards us, not our love towards Christ, is the ground of expectation and true foundation of hope. Every one of us is hopeful about something, about many things. But what is the ground? What is the ground? It is Christ's love towards us. Do you think and are convinced that Christ's love still reaches up to you even in this dark moment in life? Maybe you're not convinced enough. And maybe I cannot even try to convince you. But all I know is that Christ's love can see through anywhere. Can be received in darkness, in light, everywhere. All hope was gone. But after a long Abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me. <laughs> Paul is like, Hey, you, you, you losers. <laughs> you, wh wh what are you thinking? I advised you, you didn't pay attention to me. I spoke, you just wished them away. You didn't listen. And not have, you should not have saved from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the sheep. <laughs> like, well, what are you talking about? What, what do you mean? No life will be lost, only the sheep. I mean, where are we? <laughs> well, where are we standing on? Logically, the things of God sometimes don't make sense to people because we want to try to make sense out of it. Sometimes it doesn't. And if you try to crack your brain to make sense of it, you, I don't know what will become of you. I don't know what will happen. It just can't work like that. God had said to this man that he will be in Rome. And he has expressed a desire to go and to, he appealed to the highest court in the land, to Caesar. And that is where he's headed to. Do you think his life is going to cut short before he gets there? And the Lord had said he's going to be there. But he's saying... You guys should have listened to me. But before that, there's still hope for all of you people who are hopeless. <laughs> you guys are not thinking straight right now. You don't know the way out. We can't see the sun. We can't see the stars. But listen, listen. Your life 
is going to be spared. All of you. How about that? And guys will be like, how will that happen? How is that possible? When all we see is darkness. This is the testimony. For there stood by me this night an angel of the Lord, of God, to whom I belong and whom I serve. So in the midst of darkness, in the midst of people who don't fear God, people who don't know God, people who are confused, people who are hopeless, in the midst of this situation, are you able to make this proclamation that you belong to God and that you are his servant? Because most of the time, you, you'll be like, hey, if, if this God was real, he could have saved us from this trouble. I mean, he's come down the sea before when he was with the disciples. He can do that for us, for these people to know that indeed he's God. But what happened is this drama continued. But Paul is making a very wonderful statement that even when you are with your, the friends, your people out there, people who do not know God and you are in a dark place, you are to proclaim God even right there. I belong to Jesus. I belong to Jesus. I am his servant. It's <laughs> like, well, would you speak to your God to help us? If he's, he, if he's done that before, he can do it. And Paul said to God, to whom I belong and who I serve. So the question is, who do you belong to and who do you serve? Because you can't serve two masters. You will love one and hate the other. Where is your allegiance? Would you say those words in the middle of trouble? This is what the angel said. Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. That's an encouragement, right? Because the end result is to appear before Caesar, but the in-between, we don't know. He's in the middle of trouble, in dark place, a confused situation. This is where you find yourself in. He's already painted a picture of the end. You're gonna appear before him. But then the situations, they say otherwise. <laughs> the situations are saying, you can't survive it. You don't even know how to swim. <laughs> like some of us, right? <laughs> you can't even, you know, you, you gotta hold a, <laughs> you know those things we used to hold and it's like we're dying. <laughs> trying to swim. You, you can't even swim. In fact, you, the, the, you see water and you're like, uh-uh. I only use this to, to drink dawa and <laughs> to make soup. That is all I know about water when you take a shower. I can't swim. How are we going to do it? But even if I did, for how long? How long can I hold my breath. I don't know where the land is. I can't see it. I don't know it. How long? Hope is called the anchor of the soul because it gives stability to the, to the Christian life. But hope is not simply a wish, saying, I wish such, I wish this, I wish this would take place. Rather, it is that which latches on to the certainty of the promise of the future that God has made. 
If he's made a promise, he's gonna make, bring it to fulfillment. If he said it, he's gonna fulfill it. You can trust him. You can trust him. In a prayer made by Solomon, what we are going through on Thursday night, he said that your promises that you spoke to our forefathers until, until today, not one of them have not been fulfilled by you. Like this is a God that can be trusted. And maybe you find yourself in a situation where you feel like, I, I, can't, I don't know how to trust him. I don't know what to think. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to behave. All hope is gone. All hope is gone. But he says, God told him at night, you must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted all those who sail with you. <laughs> you know what that means? That a bunch of these prisoners and everybody there, they're gonna be safe because Paul is right in there. <laughs> Think about it. You know, sometimes we wanna give up but God wants to use you so that other people will be safe. God wants to use you to bring the gospel to many people so that they will say, hey, I am experiencing such joy, such fulfillment because he did preach the gospel to me. Because I received encouragement from him. Some of you people are probably like Barnabas. Sons and daughters of encouragement. All you're supposed to do is to encourage people when people feel depressed, when people are not encouraged anymore. They see you and they, they, there's a joy that comes on them. They, it's overwhelming and they just want to hear what you say. They just want to hang around you. But I tell you, people there, there's some other human beings they say one word, you want to run for your life. No encouragement at all. Whatever they say is like, why did you even open your mouth? You're a killer. <laughs> You're a destroyer. Hope for the hopeless. All of these people were hopeless. But because Paul has received encouragement, the Lord told him, these other people, because they are with you, they are also safe. They are also safe. Therefore, take heart, men, for I believe, God, that it will be just as it was told to me. I believe what he said is exactly what is gonna happen. What did he say? That we are all not gonna die, but the sheep is gonna be wrecked. That I am going to appear before Caesar. So which, which voice do you wanna listen to? The voice that says, no, when you're out there, you're going to die. The voice that says, God has forsaken you. The voice that says, look at your life. Look at what is happening. It troubles every corner. Does this God love you anymore? My hope does not rest in the affairs of this world. It rests in Christ who is coming again. Because he said so. He says he's gonna come. He says he's gonna return to pick us up. So my hope is not in the things that I see here. They are very temporal, very temporal. Today they're here, tomorrow they're gone. 
Is your faith anchored in Christ or on the things that you see? Therefore, don't, don't lose it. Take heart, man. Be encouraged. The Lord is aware of your troubles. The Lord knows all the pain you have gone through. In his appointed time, he's, he's never late nor early. He's on time. His on time might be next year. His time might be 10 years, but his on time. Don't rush it. Don't try to twist his arm. He's on time. But he says, verse 26, however, we must run aground on a certain island. Now when the 14th night had come, as we were driven up and down in the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors sensed that they were drawing near some land. And when they took the soundings and found it to be 20 fathoms, when they had gone a little farther, they took soundings again and found it to be 15 fathoms. Then, fearing lest we should run aground on the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for the day to come. And you see what is happening with these people. This, their, their, their belief system is kind of, you know, they, they don't trust that God, whatever he said, he's going to bring it to fulfillment that he knows everything. Even when they get stuck, he's still going to get them out. Um, they're just worried, you know. They, they, these sailors, they, they have a way of trying to, to measure the depth of the sea and the land. So when they get closer, they will drop their, um, their anchors and know that, you know, we are a few miles off the, the coast. And so it would help them to start preparing for landing. And when they realize that things are not working the way they thought, all they would pray for is to see the light of the day. To see the light of the day. Friends, have you ever prayed for a new day? Some of you are just used to the fact that you sleep and you wake up. You sleep and you wake up. Everything is normal. But if you've been in such situation, every minute you see the light of the day is a miracle. Every minute you see or you have breath and you can see things and you can think straight is a miracle. Because you don't know what is gonna happen next? Whether you're gonna drown, you gotta to learn to thank God for everything. Don't take chances. God, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us. Trespassers are there every day. <laughs> Have you noticed when you, you write on a board somewhere, that no trespassing. Trespassers will be persecuted. You know what they're going to do? They're just going to make a road just right there. <laughs> they're going to walk right through it. You, you put a, a post and say, this land is not for sale, and you put a contract there, they want to call you. They say, are you selling this land? <laughs> we, we, we're weird people, right? <laughs> we just want to go the, the opposite way. You know, this, this nature, we, we were born with it, the Adamic nature. You, you know, the, 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 the jobs that parents are doing, is to try to train their children right because they know wrong from the beginning. <laughs> Your job is trying to undo what was, was, it's already in there. You're trying to make it right. When they think they, these kids, they think they know it all. 
they can figure things out, they can, they can save the whole world. They think they can. The software that they came with, it is wrong. And the problem is, we cannot rewrite it. Only the Lord can work. You know, that's why the Bible says, train up a child. In what? In the ways of the Lord. So when they are of age, they will not depart from it. Train them. Because they have another training <laughs> that you gotta undo. We know evil. We can practice evil, no big deal. Don't take things for granted, friends. Always thank God and hold on to the promises that God has given to us. Hold on to them. He said you're gonna be there. Don't get worried about the now. Who amongst you by worrying about tomorrow can add a millisecond to it? None of us. So why worry? Why worry? They were worried and all they are praying for is just to see the light of the day. And when the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, when they had let down the, the, the scarf into the sea under the pretense of putting anchors from the prow. You know, these guys are just trying to, they have seen it all. They have seen all the dangers. You know, they're, all they're trying to do is, you know, to find a safe way to just drive off because this is, it's not working. They've been there for days. All this encouragement that Paul is giving is just finding a dead end, hitting the walls. They don't see how it's gonna work. They don't see how this is making sense to them. So they're, they're planning to escape. <laughs> uh, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, Unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Is that profound? If you know, cannot stay in, you cannot be saved, friends. Stay in the boat and he will keep you safe. He will calm the wind. He will grab you by his hands. He will do whatever but he will keep you safe. So when he says you stay, you stay. You know, most of the time, because we, we lose patience, just like that. We don't want to stay. We have figured out a way that we think is godly and it's not. And all we want to do is just to jump off the cliff and find another route. Or think that we, we know how to swim so we can swim our way out, to, out of this problem. But how long can you do that? How long would you hold your breath? How long would you run away? Stay in there. Paul is rightly saying that if these people, I have heard from the Lord, He's given me a conviction. If he had told me that we should find another way, he's a clear God. He's always made things clear to me, at least. What he said clearly, that I must appear to Caesar, that all of you guys are going to be saved because I'm here with you. The Lord is gracious to all of us. Do not be dismayed. Hold on. Unless these men stay in the ship, they cannot be saved. And all I want to say to us today, unless you stay put in Christ, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. 
you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Stay in him. Whether uh, there's storms, whether there's peace or no peace, whatever it is, I would encourage you to stay in the Lord. Be found in the Lord. Don't run away. As I bring the worship team to come, don't run away. Find encouragement from God's word. And you know, one word of an encouragement goes a long way. It goes a long way. Be someone who would always encourage people. Encourage people. And also, when people don't listen, say whatever the Lord has told you to say. Whether they want to listen or they don't want to listen. Your job is to proclaim it to them. Speak to people. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the scarf and let it fall off. And as day was about to dawn, Paul implored them all to take food, saying, Today is the 14th day. You have waited and continued without food and eaten nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take nourishment, for this is for your survival, since not a hair will fall from the head of any of you. I mean, think about it. This word that is speaking to a people who are discouraged, people who are hopeless, and he's saying, not a hair, nothing. You're not going to lose anything. The Lord has said it. The Lord will do it. And when he had said these things, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then they were all encouraged and also took food themselves. And in all, we were 276 persons on the ship. So when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and threw out the wheat into the sea. They received encouragement from the apostle. I pray that we'll also be a people who would encourage other people also. And when it was day, they did not recognize the land. They did not recognize the land, but they observed a bay with a beach and to which they plan to run the ship if possible. And they let go of the anchors and left them in the sea. Meanwhile, losing the rudder ropes. And they hoisted the mainsail to the wind and made for shore. But striking a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the prow stuck fast and remained immovable, but the stern was being broken, broken up by the violence of the waves. And the soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners, let any of them should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wanting to save Paul, kept them from their, from their purpose and commanded that those who could swim should jump over, overboard fast and get to the island and the rest some on board and some on parts of the ship. And so it was that they all escaped safely to the land. Friends, when God has spoken it, the Bible tells us that He is always looking into His Word to fulfill it. So, when he spoke to Paul, 
he said, Paul actually told them, that none of you people will perish except the what? The sheep. And the sheep owner will be, I'd rather lose the prisoners and maintain my source of income, right? You want to lose your boat? You want to lose your sheep? These people are none of my business. In fact, this is not a travel ship. It's a cargo ship. What do you mean all of us are going to be safe and my business is going to be ruined? But you know, sometimes the Lord in His sovereignty would cause these things to happen. Maybe for you to lose everything that your faith is anchored to so that you perhaps you can trust in him the more. Jesus said to that uh, young man, rich young ruler, who asked, hey, what can I do to inherit the kingdom? I have done all. I've kept the commandment from my youth. Jesus is God. He knows our hearts. He knows what is getting a grip of our hearts. He said, hey, go sell this and follow me. What did he do? The Bible says he went away sorrowful. He went away sorrowful. And we see here, God made a providence for them to swim. It was not a very far distance. They could hold it. But the ship did not survive. Because God said so. God would have made it, you know, help them to, to get the ship to the shore. No problem. But he said, this is not going to make it. But every one of you is going to make it. Don't be attached to the things that aid to our lives here on earth. Hold them loosely so that when they go, you're still going to have your hope in Christ. Don't hold them so tight. Hold them loose. They wanted to kill the prisoners. Why? Because if one prisoner would escape, then that uh, the uh, the soldiers would be killed because they've let them escape. And so they were planning against. But God in his wisdom made a way long ago before they knew it. All of them, they escaped to the land safely. We're going to continue next week. But friends, there is hope for the hopeless. Maybe you came in today not knowing about anything, about tomorrow, about life, about things. The Lord is probably saying to you that I got it in control. I know the end from the beginning. Would you just trust my word for it? Would you trust it? Do you believe that what I said is what I'm going to do? You know, Charles Spurgeon says that all our infirmities, whatever they are, are just opportunities for God to display his gracious work in us. God wants to display his work in us. Don't run away. Don't run away. Don't say, oh, maybe I can't be used. I can't. The Lord, you, what is my purpose here in this life? No, no, no. The Lord, he's ordained different paths for every one of us. As Pastor Josh was saying, maybe you're here. The Lord is calling on to you. The Lord has something he wants you to do. Maybe we've, we've heard the voice, but we don't want to take chances. We don't want to go that route. We've seen the storms. We've seen the dangers. 
We've seen all the uncertain things that we, we don't want to get involved with. But you know, the beautiful things with taking a step of faith is when you're moving this way, He who is in you is moving with you. He's not letting you go alone. He's with you. He said, I will be with you until the end of time. Would you trust that he knows it? And he knows better than we do. Let us pray together. God, we thank you. Thank you, Almighty God, for what you have done. Thank you for your grace that is sufficient for us. That even when we are losing it, God, you still are mindful of us. You still draw in us your gentle voice calling. And I pray for as many as are gathered in this place and you have called them to serve you in whatever capacity. Lord, I pray that they'll hearken to your voice and follow you. I know we have a lot of voices out there. I pray that your voice will be distinct apart from all others. And I pray that we'll be encouraged. I pray that our hope will not be deemed. For Lord, if you said it, you're going to make it to come to pass. And we trust in you. We believe in you. So we ask that you'd quicken our understanding in our hearts to really get a grasp of what you're telling us today. May your word become alive to us. And Lord, even as we serve you with our offerings this morning, we pray that we'll give a percentage that will bring glory to you and it will aid the furtherance of your gospel. We bless you and we thank you in Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen.